You're listening to a podcast from thespoilist.com. Cyberspace, the new frontier. These are the voyages of the podcast First Contact. Its mission, to explore every episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. To seek out new viewers and have new conversations. To boldly view what many have viewed before. Welcome to First Contact, the Star Trek The Next Generation intro cast, where two long-time fans of the show guide a virgin through the corridors and adventures of the Enterprise D. I'm Andrew. I'm James. And I'm Alex. This week we have been watching The Emissary. It was written by Richard Manning, Hans Beimler and Thomas H. Calder and directed by Cliff Bow. It first aired the week of June 26, 1989. James, tell me what happens in Emissary. Following the Cardassian occupation of Bajor, Commander Benjamin Sisko arrives on board Deep Space Nine. No, 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 wait, wait, sorry, so, sorry, that, that's my mistake. Tell me what happens in the Emissary. Oh, okay. The Enterprise is diverted on a secret mission to pick up Special Emissary Kalar, a half-Klingon who has a history with Worf. They must stop a Klingon sleeper ship who think they are still at war with the Federation and look set to destroy a number of colonies. Picard plays Cupid and makes Worf work with his former lover to come up with a solution that doesn't involve blowing up the Klingons. They fight and then do other things and then Worf comes up with a clever resolution and Kalar escorts the Klingons back to the Empire. It's a big Klingon episode. Alex, you've had problems with the Klingons in the past, but what did you think of this one? Um, well, originally we were going to do the podcast for this episode and the last episode uh, last week, but then I lost my voice for a few days, and uh, I haven't rewatched it since then, and I remember nothing about this episode. No. It's a good episode. This is a really good episode. Uh, it, 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 I seem to remember it being fun, but I'm just going to throw it out there now. I don't remember much about it. I'm not. I'm not happy. I'm, I'm going to say this <laughs> right now. I am not happy about this because I think this deserves your attention. And you know what? It deserves your memory. You you remembered Manhunt, and you don't remember this. I remember Skeletor turning up and uh, and 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 the sex and um and um yeah, that's just about yeah. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's go back to poker. Do you want to make a poker joke, anyone? What what what's funny about poker? Oh, do you do you mean like God? Imagine if we were one of those kind of podcasts. That'd be terrible. Imagine imagine you couldn't use a word like poker without it being a sex reference. God, that would be really long and hard to get through a podcast with you banging away like that constantly. But I'll give it to you. You'd have to have some spunk to do it. Anyway, the episode begins with Worf, Data, Geordi, Doctor Pulaski, and Riker all playing poker. Now, this might just seem like another one of those teaser filler scenes that doesn't go anywhere but actually I think very well used in this episode Worf wins at poker because he keeps his emotions in check you know he has a good poker face he he doesn't display what he's feeling do you understand what they did there and then it's going to be all about Worf's emotions being torn up I think that's quite clever do you not think that's clever or do you not remember anything Alex <laughs> no I, I, I remember it was sort of deconstructing deconstructing Worf and sort of showing him as the Iceman and then 
yeah, bringing it down. No, I, I, I remember that. I just, as we go on, some of the other details may become very hazy. Okay, so, you know, people are called to the bridge. The Enterprise is diverted once again because the Enterprise will never get to its primary mission. That's just one of the rules of the show and it's all mysterious and it's all quite secretive and it's quite exciting. Some good tension being built up. And then they're sent to pick up an emissary who is delivered secretly in a probe which is going at warp 9 and it's it's all very hush hush and we're not supposed to really know what's going on and that's exciting i'm not sure it makes any sense if i think about it but i really enjoyed that build up much more than say and last week's episode is quite comparable in some ways because you know a sort of ambassador is coming on board the ship and they're going to cause some problems for some of the crew but this is that setup done properly i, I would suggest but really good tension building. What, what do you think of that? Fairly decent special effect. The Enterprise having to get alongside a, a probe or a torpedo, it looks like, really. Wanted to bring Kalar on board ship. I, I don't know whether it's just that I don't remember the episode or or not. But why was she in a, a torpedo? Was there ever a particularly good reason given? There was no other way of transporting her from the star base. I seem to remember was the explanation. Well, she needed to arrive there in secret, and they had no shuttle craft that could go at warp nine. Maybe. Why did she have to arrive there in secret, though? Um, I don't know. I mean, she's a big, like seemingly a, an important figure in the Federation and indeed the Klingon Empire. Is it just because she's so prominent she can't be seen going on board a, a Federation starship? Well, you know, they're allies now. Shouldn't be a big deal. I, I think it made an exciting set piece, but they, they could have done it with a line of dialogue or two to, to explain it a bit better. I quite liked it. Didn't question it until now, but I don't think there was a great reason for that. I mean, Star Trek has a history of people in tubes, but, you know, I just I didn't really understand the reason at the time. Or now, to be honest with you. No. So the mission is that a Klingon battle cruiser was sent from the Klingon homeworld 75 years ago on a long-term mission to attack a remote Federation outpost. And the crew were kept in suspended animation and would then wake up when it arrived. That seems like a terrible plan to me. Does that seem like a terrible plan to anyone else? It, it seems very un-Klingon. To me, the idea of suspended animation alone. Yeah, and also 75 years ago. So we're basically around the the movie era. Captain Kirk going around in the Enterprise. Has warp developed that much in that space of time? Would it take 75 years to get there? I, I, I don't understand distances in Star Trek, I've got to say. You know, would that not be across the entire quadrant, the... 75 years at warp are they implying the Klingons didn't have warp because we we knew that they did have warp so I I don't really get that either this may be why I didn't remember the details of the episode (laughs) but but to be fair you you buy all that You, you forget those details because it is a great episode and it's a good plot Yeah, I absolutely agree. We're nitpicking here. I would like to point out that we are nitpicking. Other than than this episode making no impact on Alex, I think both James and I agree that this is probably one of the best of the season. I certainly think so. Oh, I I enjoyed it. Um, I just, I don't remember it. (laughs) Let's accept all that. They discover there's a Klingon ship that's going to wake up. I don't know why they just discovered it at the last minute, either. There didn't seem to be much explanation of that, other than the fact they're about to wake up. Did did an alarm go off at the High Council? Did no one think to intercept them before now and bring them back? Oh, oh that, that mission. Oh, man. I was drunk when I sent that off. Oh, golly. Oh, that's that's going to be... That's going to take a lot of explain. I suppose we should tell someone about this. Should we tell someone about this? Nah. How long was it? 75 years? Um... It can be our little secret. It's it's like if basically 
during the Second World War, Hitler had sent a bomb to America. And it was a really slow bomb, for some reason. And it was about to go off. And then, basically, Angela Merkel just phoned up Barack Obama and said, Yeah, we set this bomb in motion. Well, not we. You know, the administration at the time. Can you sort that out? Um, we can't do it. We're, we're two days behind. Um, we can't get there. Okay, so in this anecdote, who would be the German emissary that would be sent? That, of course, would be Jürgen Klinsmann, manager of the United States national soccer team. <laughs> okay, so, so like, actually none of that matters, because that's not what the episode's about. It's, it's the plot to hang on. And I thought it was really good until we got here, and when we get here into the, the special First Contact studio we all meet in, we ruin everything. And, sorry. Sorry, everyone, but... That's just the way it goes. Uh, Kalar and Worf meet, and there's a past. I like that there's a past. And I also like that they don't explain the past. So, James, what do you think of their relationship? I'm not going to ask you, Alex, even though that's the format. I'm going I'm to talk to James about this episode, because I think he's more interested. Uh, well, I don't remember anything about this episode, so... Well, I'm just going to talk to myself, then. Yeah, I thought that was really, really interesting. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you brought it up, actually. And can I just say, your presenting is, is outstanding, better than the others. Really, <laughs> thanks very much for that. I, I, you know, not a lot of people say it. I think it too, but but no one else. Yeah, I think you really take it seriously. I do take it seriously. I do. So, ba- back to the point. <laughs> yes, quite back to the point. What were we talking about? We were talking about the relationship between Worf and Kalar. <laughs> yes, Worf and Kalar. Yes, a, a past, and we've not delved into the past too much. There's clearly a lot there to talk about. And throughout the episode, there are hints of what have might gone on before. But unlike other episodes where they state things overly explicitly, here that's not really there. There's more of an undercurrent of emotion and hints towards the past, which I think is actually more powerful. The The true knowledge of what's happened it actually lets you fill in the gaps as an audience rather than them dully be doled out to you and not be as interesting as you might imagine great point really well made anyone else i don't i don't want to have a breakdown on my own here (laughs) (laughs) i'm just waiting to get to a part of the episode that i remember I, I, I like that, you know, we, we have a, a Klingon who's come along and basically called Worf out on his stubborn Klingon ways. And it happens, and, and I seem to remember it's happened before, and it happens again. But it's nice that Kalos come along and said, don't give me that Klingon crap. I don't want to be bonded with you, or whatever it was they were talking about. And just called him on the fact that he lives by these Klingon rules even though he's a Starfleet officer and has lived with humans his whole life. In a matter of honour, when Riker goes aboard the Klingon ships, the rest of the Klingons aren't as buttoned down and are actually much more interesting than Worf. Or more fun than Worf. Well, verily, Worf is quite an interesting character. But he's not a typical Klingon, you wouldn't say. But he respects all the traditions but he's adhering to them like someone would having read them in a book and not actually lived that culture. It's made clear in the meeting that uh, Worf and Kalar know each other and Worf is uncomfortable because he basically says he, he didn't want to ever see her again. But then Picard says, why don't you two work together? Go on. What are his motivations there? Is it because it's a, a cling on issue and Picard's being a bit racist or... Does he want them to resolve their feelings? Is he playing counsellor? To be fair to Picard, it is a security issue, so it makes sense to have the security officer work with Kalar. Yeah, I suppose so. And and Worf should not let his personal problems get in the way of his duties. Although, throughout this show and Deep Space Nine, he will do that every four weeks or so. And and you would think with the most stuck-up character 
you would think he is the one who wouldn't let his personal life get in the way of his duties. But you know, it's a woman involved and, and don't they complicate everything? Or, or so I've heard and seen in movies. And at least in this episode, he doesn't boast about his sexual prowess. And how he would break a human woman. She is half human, so he could break half of it. <laughs> so, she wants to destroy the ship because the Klingons get to die with honour and also it solves a whole lot of problems, but Picard wants a different solution. She doesn't see that there are any other options, which is a, a theme of the episode in some ways and, and worth not seeing certain options in another situation. But there are always other options and this is what Worf is trying to get across and this is what Picard has taught him throughout his time on the ship. The other option in the end does turn out to be cosplay, but, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll get to that later. It's just to, it's to build the tension between these two characters. And they are quite interesting because very similar, you know, her being half human. She has a lot of human traits, you would say, that perhaps Worf doesn't have, although he was raised in a human household, essentially. Oh, we've reached a bit I remember. Yes, I liked this. Um, no, I, I thought that was... Um, yeah, she was an interesting character. Um, uh, having the, the half-human thing, I mean, obviously, it, it can immediately draw parallels with, with with Spock, but I didn't feel that it sort of played it in the same way, which was a good thing. Uh, and it, it seemed to be very consciously used to draw uh, interesting character development out of Worf in a way that you wouldn't have been able to do if it was just another Klingon or just another human. I think that half-human thing is interesting, as you've said, most famously with Spock in the original series, but it seems to me in a world where they don't necessarily like conflict, that's a good way of creating conflict. When you have a character that is two different species, then you can play that conflict because... It's internalising the differences between two cultures in an individual. And that is actually very interesting. And and so often a guest star comes on board and doesn't actually do anything interesting with the characters. I think, if again we can compare to last week's episode, Luxana Troy is meant to ruffle the feathers of all the characters around. Her daughter, in some ways, who she doesn't interact that much with, and definitely Captain Picard, but this is a example of how you use a guest character to bring out something more interesting, something different in the past of one of your regulars. Certainly more effective than it's been done this season I think. When when Riker's father came on board, what did we learn? That Riker's father is an absolute asshole. There was nothing more to it really, but this is properly interesting and a really good character study and it has lots of plot going on in the background as well. It's it's difficult to disagree. I mean, yeah, that that is pretty much the size of it, really, isn't it? I mean, it's it's one of those rare things in this season. It's a good idea. I think there have been good ideas, just badly executed. There have also been Irishmen in space. Uh, up to this point, it hasn't been overused, but there, the, they do overuse the kind of half human, half something else. It it, it seems a bit easy to do that you know you you want to make this character relatable let's make them half human and you know you obviously do that with spock because you want the you're introducing the vulcans you want to introduce them in a way in which you can understand them so if they have a half human side and they're trying to move away from that human side you understand them better you understand what they're about and of course next generation has a half human half another random alien on it but they barely ever even mention that and it's pretty meaningless making her half human in the first place and all of this brings me on to the thing that i really want to talk about sex so so what i want to know is 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 um how what when they both seem to be fully clothed the entire time well no no i'm specifically talking about about her conception in that the the human and Klingon mating rituals, and 
God, I sound like I'm at a convention. <laughs> they seem somewhat at odds. How did this develop? Was it a bar fight that went wrong? He was punchy, she was horny, and well, one thing led to another. I think it might have been overstated the entire Klingons are too strong for human women. I I think that's pretty much a, a brag, a bar brag that's gone too far, and now the whole culture is doing it. Would you expect Sarek, the, the great logical Vulcan, to take a human partner? Yet he did, on more than one occasion. In this crazy cosmos, can a, a Klingon and a human not find love? Can't they? Can't they? Why not? But just, how do the mechanics of it work? When a Klingon and a human love each other very much, they have... A very special fight. But, I mean, I, I, I never thought I'd reach a point in my life where I was genuinely interested in this. But how do Klingons actually conceive? I'm pretty sure it's the same way as, as humans. It's just they have a lot of fighting mixed in. Right, because I'd always been led to believe that the whole fighting was the, the, the ritual, if you will. So it's just, it's just a preamp. It's foreplay. Yeah, right. That makes that makes more sense. If that can ever make sense. If you think about it this way, it's a warrior culture. Do you think every time they go and fight another starship or or having a battle that you know they're impregnating their enemies just because they're fighting them? Well, oh, sorry, my photon torpedo's gone off too early. Uh, I, I actually think really good use of. Counselor Troy in this episode and maybe shows she needs another female character to actually be the best friend to. That that's what she does. She's the listener. She's the best friend. That's what she'd be in a sitcom. She wouldn't be the lead, but you know, she'd be the serviceable character that sometimes gets a plot. And here she's used perfectly as a sounding board and she really works. You get to know Kalar better because of her conversations with Counselor Troy. Yeah, yeah, no, I'd go with that. It, it's the best that I've seen Troy used. Um, well, I was thinking it'd be a few episodes, but actually, it's probably the season, really, isn't it? Because I mean, Troy's only really big influence on the season, I suppose, was um, the child, and I don't ever want to talk about that again. Really, she's not a major part in this episode, but enough for it to be worthwhile her being there. I would say. <laughs> That's what it's come down to. We have to praise her when her existence is worthwhile. I, I suppose that takes us to the holodeck. Once again. Where she needs to work out some tension. And so puts on Worf's Callus Phoenix program. Which involves him going into a haunted woods and fighting some stock monsters from the 1930s, as far as I can tell. Clearly, they didn't have the budget to do more Klingon makeup, so that's why he's not fighting Klingons, or Romulans, or any other kind of actual monster. They've just put really cheap masks on. It's like the Star Trek equivalent of the cantina scene in Star Wars. And it's clearly the Planet Hell set once again, which doesn't help. It's the planet hell set with skeletons. It, it's fine, though. It's enough. It doesn't really need to be more than that. And to be fair, Worf did create this program. If Worf is going to create a holodeck program, it's probably not going to look that interesting. To nitpick, and I don't think Star Trek's been great at this in the past, I don't think the fight choreography is very good. No, I, I think that's a fair assessment. <laughs> It does not make Worf look like a a marvellous warrior and it doesn't make it look like they're fighting anything other than scarecrows, essentially. That's not really the point of the scene, which is the resolution of the tension between Worf and Kalar. Tension, that's one word for it. Where, Where they spend the whole night together 
in the spooky forest on the holodeck. Does that need cleaned up the holodeck afterwards or does it all get sucked in? You wouldn't want to be the man who has to go in there with the sponge, would you? No. Also, does the holodeck not have a lock? Can anyone just walk in on you? Um. Well, last week seemed to suggest that was the case. Well then, unless it goes wrong, in which case you can't get in from anywhere ever <laughs> or do anything. <laughs> yeah, no, that is how it works. It's good technology, good piece of technology. But again, I quite like that two weeks running, the holodeck has been in it and it's not gone wrong, which I think is progress for the holodeck. Um, one thing I did think when I was watching that scene was um, it was making me think of uh, Star Trek 3 I I don't know whether that was just me or whether uh, it was intentional but I I was certainly reminded of that quite strongly yeah I I definitely get that in Star Trek 3 the the Genesis planet which is dying and you've got Klingons there yeah that, that set might echo that but it's clearly not as good Oh well, I, I specifically was thinking of uh, the uh, the sex scene in Star Trek Three. Oh yeah, I hadn't thought of that. R- reminds me, what was the sex scene? Uh, Spock has sex with um, Savick. The what? Uh, yeah, the, the the Vulcan that sounds like um, a, a mouthwash. <laughs> Do you have bad breath? Then treat it. With Savick. And actually, this scene, again, they they consummate their love, or do it again anyway. But but that's not the end of the tension, because there's that culture clash once again, where Worf thinks because they've slept together, they have to get married, and she's basically saying no. But it's actually because Worf's so buttoned down, he actually does love this woman. And and she's turning him down because she thinks it's because of tradition. And that's... That's sad. But we've got the whole rest of the plot still to go with the Klingons about to attack the thing we don't care about. Yeah, that that is the element of the plot that I don't remember anything about. And to be fair, it, it is a very good plot. It's just the... It's just not as interesting, bizarrely. It, out of the two plots, it it's... <sighs> It's the less gripping, which you you know going in you might not have thought would be the case to you know to the credit of the other plot. Again, I just ripped it apart because they're attacking some distant outpost. Would it have been better if they were attacking something that we actually knew or cared about? Probably not, because they try to do that in every single movie. They're attacking Earth. Oh no, we never spend any time on Earth in Star Trek. It's just the audience has heard of it, so it must be important. I was going to say, what do we care about in the Star Trek universe? Because apart from the ship that you are tethered to at any one time, or the space station or whatever, you don't really have a tie to a planet. I mean, the only one would... Earth, I suppose, and maybe Vulcan. But it's not as if you ever spend any great amount of time there. I mean, they have to make an emotional tie whenever they do threaten it. I mean, the J.J. Abrams film, the only reason they can get away with... uh, uh, having that plot with Vulcan is that they tie it in with uh, Spock's mother. True. But here, it doesn't really matter. Because, again, I do think the plot I have massively undermined is a good one. You could do an entire episode about Klingons from the past waking up from a long-term mission and trying to destroy something. That's That could be a, a solid episode in its own. It was. It was called Space Seed. And and then there's the Enterprise episode, Sleeping Dogs. Everyone always mentions that one, don't they? And then there's the film Into Darkness. A lot of people have decided that it doesn't exist. I'm not sure there's a massively satisfying resolution here, because it seems so obvious. Why don't you just say Worf's in command? Okay, that makes sense, and he'll just tell them to stand down. Yeah, that, that seems perfectly reasonable. It, it wasn't like some great piece of tactical thinking just convince the Klingons that they're talking to a Klingon ship fine did that impress you at all or does it not stick in your memory in any way no I mean I I sort of vaguely remember and I mean I, I, I get that makes sense but I don't I don't really understand how that's ever meant to work in the long run well she she goes over to the ship takes them away from any danger to Federation outposts and once they're in 
Klingon space and surrounded by Klingon warbirds, they could say, actually, we're mates with the Federation now. It sounds like they're sort of fairly, you know, fairly hard line to go back to Andrew's analogy. It's like having uh, a, a, a German SS officer who's been thrown into a coma and wakes up 30, 40 years later and is told, yes, the Nazis won the Second World War. And then when they're put in Germany, <laughs> years later they're told, oh no, that didn't happen at all. And uh, and in fact, uh, since the wall's gone up, um, it's, it's quite bad. It should have been a U-boat. I should have used a U-boat. Full of frozen SS officers. There's the actual event with the the Japanese soldier who was in the jungle for how how many years was it? Forty or fifty years? Why these ITV programs are really getting extreme now? I mean, they're just running for longer and longer. I thought the inspiration for this this whole plot would have been that that story of the Japanese soldier. You might well be right. Yeah, I'm not sure the ending in that way is massively satisfying but but it's 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 all about the characters in this episode for for once for once it's all about the characters so the, the resolution just needs to tie the characters together and it it means that Kalar and Worf can work together to save the day it doesn't matter how they save the day it's just the fact that they do it together and and that was the point i was sort of making that you know that whole klingon's frozen is an interesting plot but it's somewhat irrelevant to the episode, bizarrely. You don't really care about it, so you don't think about the logic of what's happening until now. And is that plot perhaps unsatisfyingly resolved? Yes, probably, but it doesn't matter because it's not the plot we're concerned with. It's satisfying enough. The Klingons obey the chain of command, which isn't necessarily true, and hopefully... Once they're back in the Empire, all will be well. That plot is just well enough done. and But it's, again, to get Worf and Kalar back together and actually to separate them again in the end. They, they come together, they admit their feelings, it's powerful, it's interesting, it seems there is more of this story to tell, and I would certainly like to see more of this story and more of that relationship in another show, perhaps in another time, this would be done over multiple episodes. But credit to the writers that they've managed to convince me of this relationship and get invested in this relationship in the space of a single one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Quickfire. Susie Plaxon, who plays Kalar, she was previously in Star Trek Next Generation, playing Lieutenant Sealar in The Schizoid Man, the Vulcan Doctor who was there for no apparent reason. But she obviously made an impact. The uh, footage of the uh, the Klingon bird of prey uh, is, is actually the same footage from the motion picture. Um... It makes sense given the time frame. Um, I didn't actually know that. Uh, Andrew just said it, but I've repeated it because he was saying everything. Wesley didn't appear in this episode. These are the words of Maurice Hurley. Great idea, and one that worked. Hard for that one not to work, but it worked well all the way through. With the Klingons, you're dealing with emotion and passion. You've got somebody who can see something. You need that balance in the show sometimes. The show gets so intellectually smug and self-serving, and you need something like that to break it off. Someone willing to storm the barricades. The idea of half Klingon was fun. Maurice Hurley, who died earlier. Ha 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 ha!
wasn't ready for that. Collectively, we're very, very sorry. But personally, I am also sorry. Once again, returning to that trusty staple of the podcast, the Nitpicker's Guide for Next Generation Trekkers. Uh, And in the book, they say... Towards the end of the show, the main viewer shows the 73-year-old Klingon ship coming towards the Enterprise. Interestingly, it's the same footage used for the Klingon ship in the episode Heart of Glory. In other words, the Klingons haven't changed their ship design in over 70 years. Even more interestingly, one year later, the episode of Matter of Honour featured a great-looking Klingon ship, obviously a much more advanced design than the one shown in Heart of Glory. Evidently, the Klingons got tired of having nerdy-looking spaceships in the time between Heart of Glory and Matter of Honour, and they made an all-out effort to improve themselves. Can I just ask that for any of our listeners, if, if we ever reach the point of this kill us I'd also like to point out that we have already seen Excelsior class ships in Star Trek Next Generation of which the Enterprise B was one and uh, so it's the same thing so don't complain about that kind of thing oh was I just that nerdy And so that wraps up another episode as we hurtle towards the end of the season. Next week we will be talking about peak performance. I hope you will join us then. Goodbye. 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 Is it too late to say I'm sorry?